screen. Hearing today from Dr. Tom Ziegler and Dr. Rebecca Thomas. And um, I see from our guest list here that we have a number of um, folks who are PhD students and postdocs as well. So it might be nice to um, uh, be able to make sure our audience understands the resources available to them as well and not just faculty. So I'll be here to help navigate the, the uh, the um, the questions and answers and Dr. Ziegler and Dr. Thomas, please take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Waldrop. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Yeah. Okay, good. So Rebecca and I are really, really happy that you invited us to give this because, you know, we really consider ourselves a new and improved GCRC. I see a few uh, colleagues like Sandy and a few others who we, Laura, that we've worked with or are working with, but many of you are new uh, to our unit and it's really remarkable as to uh, what Rebecca and colleagues have done, um, particularly over the last year during the COVID uh, crisis. I mean, Rebecca has, and Rebecca is going to give most of this presentation, but I just wanted to just mention with, you know, COVID has been bad for everybody except for us because we have, we have a ton of uh, COVID uh, projects going on. And what that has done is it has allowed us to bring in more funding. And Rebecca can talk about that later because um, the GCRC it, with some exceptions, which we'll talk about, unlike in years past, maybe in, prior to about five years ago was completely free but now there are charges. And so we will work with you on those as you put our, our charges into your grants. But what is the, G well, let me just say who I am because most of you don't know me, I don't think. I'm a professor of medicine in the M division. I've been a director in the Emory University Hospital GCRC since 1999. Uh, my office is down there. And um, in the, EUH uh, unit right across from the cafeteria. And um, I am a clinical investigator myself. And, you know, I've worked with and collaborated with Sandy and, and others in the School of Nursing, Aaron Ferranti, et cetera, over, over time. And our goal is to really bring in more uh, School of Nursing investigators. Rebecca, do you want to just introduce yourself? And then I'll do the first two side, slides and then I'll switch back to Rebecca. Sure. <clears throat> I guess it's afternoon now, it's 1203, and um, I echo what Dr. Ziegler said. Thank you so much for allowing us to come and talk to you today. Um, I am the um, nursing director for our outpatient research units at Emory University Hospital here on the Clifton campus, Emory University mid And then I also have some inpatient Emory healthcare duties, but for the purpose of this, I'm wearing my GCRC hat. Okay, so I'll just do the first couple slides and then Rebecca will take over. It'll be a little bit of a dog and pony show here, but hopefully a good one. So what, what is the GCRC? Um, actually, the name comes, it used to be called the General Clinical Research Centers around the country, and I won't talk too much historical stuff. Now it's a, a key component of the Georgia uh, Clinical and Translational Research Alliance. The, and so that's uh, Morehouse, uh, UGA, uh, yeah, Georgia Tech and us, that's where the G comes from. And so we call ourselves the, the GCRCs because we do have units at Morehouse School of Medicine, Grady Hospital, Midtown, and some scattered places that we kind of claim is under our umbrella. But our main units on, <clears throat> in Atlanta are the ones I just mentioned. And so we're here to <clears throat> facilitate your research at any of those sites. And so what, it, what do we do? We, we support investigators with really research infrastructure to conduct your clinical research. Um, we have a number of uh, resources that we've really expanded for the past year and a half. We have dedicated space. We have very high quality research nursing, laboratory processing, uh, bionutrition and exercise physiology services. And uh, what's one of our newest feeds is study coordinator services. And we offer these at a subsidized cost. 
Um, we really are open to any studies. We welcome junior investigators, students, um, senior investigators, and we take all studies, uh, federally funded studies, industry initiated studies, foundation fund studies. And um, we love uh, if you're collaborating with anybody from our Georgia CTSA partner institutions, that's a particularly high priority for us. Or if you're doing studies that you're linking with other CTSAs around the country, there's about 60 of those entities. Um, those, are, those are very high priority studies for us. Next slide, please. And then I'll do this slide and then Rebecca will take over. So this just shows you our sites uh, on the left, left to right, Emory, Clifton Road across the hall from the, well, sorry, I should say, we, were, we are still across the hall from the Clint, uh, uh, cafeteria and the HG unit. We're, we do, uh, right now we're just doing COVID type, COVID studies there. We've re relocated to a very nice space. Those of us who know of the hospital on 6D and the nurses have set that up to such a beautiful place now. Uh, we have a, a, a really nice unit at Grady. Rebecca, is that on 5C? Yep, that's correct. And then we have a nice space in Midtown in the, I forgot the name of the, what's the name of the, the sadly? The Davis the building. building. Yeah, David Fisher building. It's around the corner from the uh, birds. If any of you have been to Midtown, there's a big bird, I forgot what you call it. And then, oh, forgot to mention, we also have a very nice site at the CAP, the Children's Academic uh, Program Center at um, across the street from Executive Park. It's part of our CTSA, but it's also part of our one of our GCRC units. There's also a very nice unit on the lower left at UGA. They have a lot of resources. So if you're collaborating or anticipate collaborating with UGA faculty, we will put you in touch and match make you with the nurses and the faculty over there. And then I mentioned Morehouse has a very nice unit as well. And I'll let uh, Rebecca take over from here. Yeah, so this slide is an overview of our GCRC leadership. And as of April, Dr. Colleen Kraft took over as our overall program director. And then Priscilla Pimu is the program co-director out of Morehouse School of Medicine. And each site that Dr. Ziegler just mentioned has a site-specific director. And here on the Clifton campus, our director is Dr. Tom Ziegler. At our Grady location on 5C, it's Dr. Guillermo Amperez. And then Morehouse, it's Priscilla Johnson. And then at um, UGA, it's Brad Phillips. And then as I mentioned earlier, I'm the nursing director for our Emory and our Grady units. Um, we have recently revamped our core laboratory and we have hired a lab manager. She comes from up to us from Georgia Tech. So she has a lot of experience building core labs. So her name is um, Dahlia Gillick and we're really excited to have her. Um, many of you have probably worked with Deborah Clem in the past. Um, she's our administrative director. And then um, Dr. Ziegler is gonna talk about bionutrition but we've made a lot of changes in our bionutrition area. And um, Dr. Ronnie Singh is the co-director and oversees the activities in our bionutrition area alongside Dr. Ziegler. Um, we have two full-time dietitians who um, have the ability to support us. So we're really excited about the changes to our bionutrition area. And then Jane Clark is our associate program director and Dr. Ziegler mentioned coordinator services. Um, Jane also um, oversees our coordinator pool and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, more about that in a couple slides. And then another new addition to our GCRC is Michelle Rogers. Um, Michelle Rogers is our senior business manager and she came to us from research administration. So she's gonna be the contact for any budgeting um, and then our invoicing. You know, our invoicing in the past has been a, a source of contention, I think, for many individuals. So she has really streamlined that process. Um, so she would be the contact for any budgeting. Um, needs. Re Rebecca, and, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we're having a little trouble hearing you. You're, uh, we can hear you, but it sounds a little bit underwater. Okay. You could either turn up your mic or get closer to your mic. Or... Yeah. And then, is that better? That's better. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then the individual who kind of keeps us all going and keeps us honest is Jeb Williams. And he's our program coordinator and he's the contact for our phlebotomy program. And then our SAC submissions, um, if you have to do any kind of in-servicing, Jeb was the point of contact there. 
And then just to talk a little bit about some of our resources, um, at the Clifton site, we do have inpatient capabilities. Um, and those, those rooms are located on 7G of um, the hospital here at Clifton Road. And then our outpatient, and we've talked about the spaces that we offer outpatient services. So just a few examples of some of the nursing services that we offer um, is study protocol review for nursing efficacy and safety, um, nursing evaluation and assessment, medication, administration and any kind of teaching associated. Um, we do all phases of clinical trials and um, investigational drug infusions. We can assist and monitor um, invasive procedures um, at our Grady facility. Our nurses help with rectal biopsies, um, muscle biopsies, LPs here at the Clifton campus. So they have a lot of experience assisting with invasive procedures. Um, basic and pharmacokinetic blood sampling, and then routine and complex vital sign monitoring. I talk Again, get a, little get a little closer if you can, Rebecca. I'm sorry. Um, and I spoke a little bit about our lab. So um, in February, we did a complete overhaul of our laboratory across all of our three sites. So we have a lab here at Clifton, at Grady, and Midtown as well. And one of the things that we're very proud um, to announce is that is overseen by a medical technologist. So we have somebody who came from the Emory Medical Laboratory who now does all of our processing. Um, so really the quality has been upped with the addition of that individual. Um, so we can do any kind of processing. Um, we have short-term and long-term sample storage. Um, we have a variety of different types of freezers, most of which have been replaced within the last year. We also now have a monitoring system. It's 24 seven. So if there's any kind of deviations or variations in the temperatures, um, we have individuals who get notified in real time. So if somebody needs to come in and transfer samples to another freezer, we now get notified and we have the ability to do that. We also can print um, temp logs out of those as well because I know a lot of sponsors want to see you know, that information. Um, we use the LIMS system, um, so every sample is logged into LIMS, so that way, again, if we do have something with temperature variation, we know that in real time, um, and then it also helps when um, individuals want to retrieve their samples, so we're using that. Every study is logged into that. So, Dr. Ziegler, you want to talk a little bit about bio-nutrition? Yeah, let me, and again, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the senior citizen in this panel. So I've, I've, I've seen this place change and grow over time. And, and it's really, I, it, it, like particularly in the last couple of years under uh, Colleen Kraft's leadership, it, or really in the last year and a half, um, I'm really proud with what we're doing. The other thing that Rebecca has initiated, some of you may remember the, there still is this process. Once you have a protocol that you want to submit to us and we can help you develop that protocol before submission. We can help you with all things soup to nuts before you submit the thing for review. We have a very expedited review process that we can talk about. Um, but what nurses do now, and with the help of our laboratory and bionutrition services, we'll directly help you, if not write what we call the day-to-day -day orders, which are the quote unquote physician orders that have to be signed by an NP, a PA or a physician that are, are basically your study orders. So that when, you're, or when your patient, when your uh, participant comes to the units, that we do exactly what you want us to do in the particular order you want. And so after we blab maybe through this slide, we can maybe open up for questions initially because I don't wanna do all, we, we shouldn't just do all the talking to you guys. And then as, as Rebecca mentioned, lab has been completely renovated. And so we have uh, Rebecca is, I mean, Veronica is a medical technologist and we've just hired a supervisor, an overall laboratory supervisor who supervises her. And then another um, laboratory technician at the Grady site and the, the staff, the nursing and the laboratory staff can float around to Grady or Midtown depending on the need. And so uh, Rebecca kind of herds the cats for the nursing and in the laboratory. With regard to bionutrition, <clears throat> we, in the past like 12 years or so, we had one bionutritionist uh, who was our um, uh, one person. And I don't know if uh, 
if Jennifer Frediani is on, but she used to be our GCRC bionutrition and exercise physiologist several years ago, about 10 years ago or so before she got her PhD. But um, <clears throat> we now uh, expanded our flexibility in bionutrition exercise really nicely. Ronnie Singh, many of you may know, is a professor of uh, human genetics and handles the medical uh, clinics for people with inborn errors of metabolism like PKU, et cetera. She's, an M she's a PhD RD and she has a whole cadre of dietitians. We are trained, we have trained uh, three of those MSRDs to really be our bionutrition unit with under the direction of Ronnie and I. So we have a lot of flexibility now with regard to personnel and um, they are based right over in Woodruff uh, research building. So they're, it, it's all pretty seamless. So we do research meal and diet creation. And this can all be for, we do protocol development. If you have a bionutrition component to your grant or you're thinking of grant, a grant that may want that like myself and Dr. Singh and, and the dietitians can help you develop that. Uh, nutritional status assessment dietary intake analysis with 24-hour recalls, three-day food records. The software is called NDSR that many of you are familiar with, but we can uh, help you with other uh, software like ASA 24 <clears throat> software for 24-hour recall analysis, diet education and counseling. We have some really nice exercise treadmill. I don't know, Sam, let's see, is Dr. Gary on the call? Is Rebecca on the call? But she had several protocols over the years with exercise testing. And we had, can do either maximal or submax testing. We have some brand new equipment, including an exercise ergometer bike, as well as a treadmill. So if you're doing maximal testing, and I have to tell you that our dietitians are getting trained on that in a few weeks. So we're not up, up to speed on that. We are doing submax testing on the treadmill, but the bike and everything is going to be will be fully up to speed in a few weeks. As far as body composition, we have a bod pod, which really provides a, mm, similar data as the DEXA does. We have a brand new DEXA just installed a couple weeks ago um, with some fancy sarcopenia and other software in it. And the dietitians have been trained on that. The bod pod is also with us. And the bod pod is a little pod you sit in and it gives similar but not as complete data as the DEXA. The DEXA, we can give you visceral adipose to, uh, as well as body fat compartments and, uh, and lean mass measures. With the bod pod, you more or less get, you know, the percent body fat and, and lean mass. It's very state of the art. Um, and it's also, and I was talking to one of your nursing faculty the other day, and I can't see her name on here, but um, pregnant women can go into the bod pod. If there's body composition studies that you want done in women or women who are anticipating pregnancy or post-pregnancy, because it doesn't give off radiation. And we really want to get that use, use going. We also have a very nice like multi-frequency BIA machine. And so that uh, bionutrition unit has been really upgraded. I don't know, uh, maybe next slide, maybe we can take questions, but maybe we want to discuss sort of I don't know if it's the time, right time, Rebecca, because I don't want to take all the time. Uh, the cost of all these wonderful services. Yes. Does anybody have any questions right first before we go on? I have a question. Um, hi, Tom and Rebecca, thanks so much for Good presenting evening. today. Um, I have a question about um, pediatric protocols and services that you offer. I know you mentioned you have a center at CHOA, but my understanding was that was I didn't understand that you were actually in there providing nursing and laboratory services. I understood it was just kind of a space for us to go in and use. Do you provide uh, services there? And absolutely. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your question. I, and the other question I had probably is for you, Tom, is how pediatric friendly are your bionutrition and exercise physiology services? Very. So um, let me answer the first question. Yes, the Center for Academic Pediatrics, which you, as you guys know, is this brand new building right off the highway across from Executive Park. Uh, dang, what's the nurse's name, Rebecca? Cheryl Stone. Cheryl? Stone, Cheryl Stone. Jones? Stone. Oh, Cheryl Stone. Yeah, there's something wrong with your mic. I can hear you, but it's a little bit underwater. Um, 
Yes. And we can facilitate you. Uh, Cheryl Stone is absolutely wonderful. She's like the Rebecca Thomas of the CAP. They have a very, very nice, large unit. It's very busy. They're very user friendly. They have charges like we do, similar to our charges. And Cheryl will shepherd you through to that unit. They will take people up to the age of 21. We will take people at Emory up above the age of 16. So if you have an adolescent study sitting above, we can take the participants. Uh, if, you, if they're under um, 21, I mean, you probably might want to, like some studies go there for their kids up to the age of 16, and then they use our unit. We have a few studies like that. So they have all the resources that we have. They actually have, yeah. They can, um, our dietitians um, are available for them. They have their own dietitian, um, Anisha, that we work with um, over there. They don't, I, you know, I might be speaking on a turn. They don't have, they have a BIA machine over there like we have for body composition, a nice multi-frequency one. The DEXA for the kids is at Eggleston. And so you got to, and we do that. We traipse the kids, they have to come over to Eggleston for that. If they're 16 and above, they can, they can be screened, scanned on our machines. They don't have a bod pod, but they have all the other stuff listed here. They have their own nursing uh, laboratory. They're linked with us. They have limbs. Um, they're a little bit independent of us. I don't like, I don't think, um, like we don't control them, right, Rebecca? They're kind of linked with us. They're separate, but they're separate, but linked, if that answers your question. And what was your other question, Jeannie? Um, no, I think you answered both of the questions. So the, okay. uh, the other question was about how PEDS friendly is the bionutrition services. So yeah, you answered PEDS, both. Yeah. Think. Yeah. Just let me, uh, what I would say is, you know, communicate with Rebecca and I after this talk, and we'll set you up with Cheryl. And, um, and we'll go from there and we'll do whatever we can to facilitate your resources. I mean, we're really trying to be cup half full um, more than we've been in the past. And I'd say we are very cup half full right now. Um, any qu other, other questions before we go on? Just do you have a peds bod pod over there? We don't. I mean, we, we, we put in a, no, we wanted to get a pea pod, but that's really for two year olds and under. So we don't have a peds bod pod. So it would be 16 and above, Sandy. Okay. But we really want to use the bod pod. I mean, we had some extra money lying around about four years ago that we had to lose it or use it or lose it. So we said, let's get a bod pod. And so we got a bod pod now sitting there unused. Um, it's in the same space as the DEXA, yeah. but it's a nice machine. I've used and, it before and it's um, very, uh, I would say participant friendly um, in terms of encouraging people to, to use it to get body composition. It does, some people do get claustrophobic, so you have to, you know, just deal with that. But I think that's a great asset. Yeah, and we're happy to talk to you about it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm the so-called director of the, I do nutrition oriented research so I can handle nutrition oriented questions as you go on. Any other questions right now? So I have a question. So for the DEXA, could that be used for children too or it's only adult only? No, for, for DEXA in children, you would work through Cheryl. D Did I say her name right, Rebecca? Is it Cheryl? Yeah. Stone, yeah. Cheryl Stone. <laughs> uh, and then they would, she would facilitate use of the DEXA. It's actually over on our campus at, at, at Emory Children's Center. Okay, thank you. Yes, you can do DEXA in kids. Um, the other thing we, yeah, I mean, we, I collaborate closely with um, Jessica Alvarez. She's a soon to be associate prof with a RD PhD. This is not a GCRC resource, but she's got MRI set up for all the body composition using MRI. So for that, we use the MRI um, scanner located at Emory University Hospital. Um, and that gives you very good information on fat and lean tissue and the fat inside the tissue. Um, 
So that's something I could uh, facilitate you meeting her with her if you need. And, you know, I don't know if she'd be able to do it. But it's not her. It's not a re. It's it's sort of a potential resource. And that, well, uh, any other questions? I have another question, Tom. Do you and Rebecca? Do you offer any sort of respiratory services like spirometry or anything like that at this point? We do. Um, several years ago, we bought a brand new Coco um, Epi, you know, respiratory function uh, piece of equipment, and no one's used it. Um, it we could train our folks to, and that's a good point. We haven't had a need, so it hasn't been anybody wanted it, but I think we can, we can get that up and running um, if needed. Um, what I hear about respiratory is a little weird. You know, like we do a lot of respiratory function tests in cystic fibrosis, and what they say is that it's pretty, it's pretty, um, what's the word? Um, you want someone to do it who does it every day, like like a respiratory tech. And so like we often in our CF studies, we use like the most recent clinical pulmonary function tests because we feel those are more, we're more comfortable with those, but we could potentially, you know, we have the equipment lying around, but we have not been, we were trained on it years ago, but then we kind of, there was no need. So we never, we never got it up and running that we can make things happen. We can work things out. You know, we might put you in touch, you know, we'll, we can, you know, if there's a, if there's a need, the way Rebecca and um, Colleen have set and set us up and the rest of us is, if there's a need, we'll make it happen somehow. And we don't want to just kind of like do respiratory tests. You know, we want to have it, make sure that they're accurate. And there's a little bit of a, I'm not thinking of, thinking of the right word, it's not the user, it's the person who administers the test. Uh, there's an element of experience that you need with that equipment. Yeah, so I can speak just a little bit to the fee schedule. So um, Dr. Ziegler touched upon it a little bit. So about a year and a half ago, um, our nursing services used to be billed on an hourly rate. So one of the things that we, um, we had some individuals who we, um, we polled, if you will. And one of the things that came out of that, now our nursing services is based on a, a um, it's more acuity protocol based. So it's not on an hourly rate. So it's a tiered approach. So we have seven levels. Um, so an example, you know, a level one visit would be something that's just a blood draw, some vital signs, maybe a nursing assessment, and that would be $90 a patient. Um, and then it goes up based on the intensity, you know, of the protocol. And our fee schedule is um, posted on our Georgia CTSA website, as well as a lot of the information that Dr. Ziegler and I are speaking about today. Um, with our laboratory services and our coordinator services, right now that is an hourly rate. But with our laboratory services, with the addition of our lab manager, we're um, looking towards more of a set fee as well. Um, I know it's easier for individuals to budget if they know exactly how much it's gonna cost. So, you know, trying to budget on an hourly rate sometimes is a little challenging. So we're in the process right now of looking at our laboratory services. So hopefully we can follow the same model as we have with our nursing services. Can we send that? Uh, Sandy's asking, do we have that? I said, I don't think so on this slide. Yeah. Rebecca can send that to you. We can send you guys the link. I guess we can go through yeah. uh, Drenna and then she can pass it on to faculty because it's a very... It's a, you know, it's pretty, pretty good. We don't have it there, right? No, no, but we can definitely send it out to everyone after this is over. Um, so I've said coordinator services a, a couple times. Um, so one of the things that's really come out of COVID is um, study teams needing coordinator support. Um, so this is something that we started probably about three months ago, and it has grown by leaps and bounds. We went from a halftime person to now we have three full time coordinators and then we have two 50% FTEs that we support and we offer a wide range of research coordination and management services. All of our coordinators are experienced, trained, and they're credentialed at Emory Healthcare and Grady. Um, they're available to any investigators who are seeking assistance with management of multi-site trials or day-to-day -day oversight of research programs. 
And the beauty of this is we carry the FTE, so you only pay for what you use. Um, and at this point, it's an $85 an hour charge, um, and our coordinators keep very detailed time records. So that's another area that we're reevaluating the cost, but as of today, it's $85 an hour, um, and you just pay for what you use. And some of the services um, that our coordinators can provide is budget development, so they can work with our business manager and the RAS representative um, on budget development, study management and coordination, um, phlebotomy. Our coordinators are all phlebotomy trained. So if you just needed help with blood draws, our coordinators can support that. Um, they have experience entering data in various types of systems. Um, and then if you have your own coordinators, but you know, maybe they're stretched or they need backup on other projects, our coordinator pool can be cross-trained to provide backup coverage for your staff. Um, they have experience and can do regulatory submissions, chart reviews and data extraction. And then another thing that's come out of COVID is biorepository. In the GCRC, we have a very extensive COVID biorepository where teams can request samples, COVID samples. Um, so our team has set up these biorepositories and they're maintaining it and we're getting ready to do something very similar at Grady. Um, we have an investigator at Grady who's interested in setting up a COVID biorepository, so our coordinators are going to assist with that. And then there's a number of different things um, that they can do. Um, so Jane Clark is our contact for that. And again, that's all on our um, website, and I'll send out the link to that as well. Thanks. And then we can work with you. The, the other thing you can do, and again, this is a, on a, well, I guess you're going to talk about that. This is on a um, case by case basis. It's actually possible, like if you need a 25% of an FTE of someone, potentially possible or 50%. Um, we're finding that the coordinator services are going to be very popular. I mean, obviously, no one can afford $80 an hour for a coordinator, but if it's just for spot duty, that's one thing, but if you need a coordinator for half time or something, we, for example, I'm on a, I'm a co I on an R01 from uh, Terry Hartman in Epi, and she just got a grant. It's a feeding study of people with polyps, whatever. So she, um, she um, is paying 50% of a, of a coordinator to support her R01. And the other 50% is us. And so um, we will assign that coordinator 50% of her time to other investigators for their needs, but then percent of her time is dedicated to uh, Terry Hartman's study. Yeah. And if you have a coordinator who needs some salary support, please reach out to us because the coordinator that we you know, are using for Terry Hartman's study, um, she needed salary support. So we were able to provide 50% of her salary support. So um, just keep that in mind um, as well. All right, Dr. Ziegler, you wanna talk about? Oh, okay, sure. Well, the other thing I was gonna say before I forget, yes. So we are, the other thing we offer and there's no charge for this is guidance and help. I mean, I do a lot of uh, mentoring in the, like the training programs of the CTSA and the TL1 and the KL2. And I'm happy to talk to you guys about that because those programs, because I see many of you are new. Many of you have, some of you have matriculated through our programs like Jeannie Rodriguez, but um, I think they're pretty well known. But if you go to the Georgia CTSA website and go under uh, training, you'll find information on our Masters of Science and our certificate program. Not really the purpose of this talk, but there's some wonderful training programs uh, that uh, people should take advantage of. And um, we probably should do a road show to School of Nursing just on that. Um, I, uh, I saw another nice party who's in the certificate program. He's not on right now. But anyway, any rate, we offer studio consultations, which is just sitting down with experts in our GCRC, we can help you with hypothesis generation, study design, editing, you know, implementation. We can put you in touch with other CTSA resources like the 
biostatistics resource and the informatics resource. We can be matchmakers or collaborators. Uh, you know, we can help you in many ways in these studio consultations. And that's something that would be done by the by some people like Rebecca, myself, uh, Guillermo Umperez, and potentially, you know, potentially Colleen Kraft uh, in the program director and the things, but also our other staff could help you with things. Um, and it just is based on what you, what you need. It's kind of under the radar, but it's something important. Okay, research education. The one of the things I wanted to bring up, I don't know what it's like in the DNP school, uh, Laura and Sandy, but like in like the nutrition PhD program uh, at LGS, our students do three, four month rotations with like, uh, it has to be one of them has to be clinical, one of them has to be basic, one of them has to be epi. I don't know if the nursing graduates, if the PhD students have to do those rotations or not. No, okay. Because I was gonna say, if you did, we can help match make you with people, including studies that are done in our GCRC if like a nurse needed a clinical uh, rotation for their PhD. Uh, they they primarily know. work with their mentors, Tom. Um, however, this is good to know because there are times when students want to um, have additional experiences. They might want to get some basic uh, or lab experience, or they might yep. want to work in a, a different clinical project. So this is uh, good to know. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Jessica Alvarez and I are in the nutrition program. We kind of co-mentor students. So we have several, uh, like these are nutrition graduates, PhD students, and they rotate with us for like four months. You know, they typically end up with a first author paper. There's lots of data lying around, but depending on the interest of the nursing trainee, even if it's a math, I don't know if you have a master's or not, or even NPEs or PAs or whatever you have over there that might want some additional experiential experience, we can, we can, and that's fun. I mean, you know, I've been around here a long time, so I'm pretty good at knowing who, you, who they should talk to. And we can make introductions and all that stuff. Like if they're interested in cardiology, Sandy would probably, you'd introduce them to our shed, Kayumi, but you know, maybe someone's interested in neurology or something like that. I mean, we know all the people that we can introduce the students to. So we like to do that. Yeah, can I say something before you go on? Yeah. Um, one of the other things, Cindy, we can do if you have, in the time of COVID, I know it's hard for people to get clinical hours. So if you have students who need clinical hours, we can help with that as well. They could do HMPs, they could do physicals. Um, so if that's something that you're interested, let me know and we can work together on that. That's a good that's point. fantastic. That's a fantastic offer. Thank you. Sandy, this is important because again, with Dr. Alvarez and I and many other people, we got a recent P30 and from in, we have a uh, sort of a research infrastructure grant for pediatric and adult cystic fibrosis. And one of the things we're going to do is max tests on the bike that we have at Emory Hospital. And with any kind of max exercise test, you need a PA, an NP, or a physician. And so we were going to talk to you about whether any of your NPs might be interested in observing those tests, at least to get some of the several hours. Um, that would be huge for us. Um, I don't know if there'd be a charge. I'm sure the investigator would be happy to pay some fee, but we don't really have that set up. But, you know, if you guys have NPs or PAs that need clinical hours, because we're so busy now. I mean, Rebecca, I mean, the GCRC is just, it's not all COVID. We're getting a lot of protocols in. I mean, how many people did we have yesterday, Rebecca, throughout the system? I mean, there's like 60, something like that. Yeah. 60 participants. I mean, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, and then, you know, if a, if, a, um, if a nurse trainee is interested in learning about how to do dietary and nutritional assessment or body composition, you know, we can help with that. If they're interested in, you know, other aspects of clinical research. I mean, we have a mission for training and we can brag. Our grant is, by the way, our grant is due 
our five-year renewal is due in July and you know, served on the study section and I've chaired the study section several times and um, they love, they meaning the reviewers, uh, they love anything to do with um, nurse training and nurse investigators as you would expect and I think we have a really strong cadre at Emory and so we really want to support you guys but you know could be a two-way street. I mean, if you use us, we help you. It's a win-win situation. Can I just say that I think um, having the CTSA support is very helpful when you submit a grant and people see that you have reached out and you, um, you have CTA support projected in a budget. One of the things that actually happens though, I have to say, Tom and Rebecca, and maybe this has been resolved over time, but there are kind of like two major barriers for um, studies. And one is the costs that are associated with these different services. Um, if somebody is not already funded or has not worked with you and built it into their grant. And then the second is that when you have a participant come to the GCRC, um, in the past, you had to have um, someone do a history and physical. So you had to either have an, an NP, you know, with a physician protocol or a physician or a PA or someone who would do that admission HMP. And that was um, an issue. So I don't know if you want let to me, speak to that. Yeah, let me speak to both of those issues. The cost we have no control over, all GCRCs nationally had a very similar cost structure as us. And in fact, we were one of the last to go from free. We used to be free, everything was free. Now we've gone to a cost structure. We were one of the last and it's been about four years. And it was all, the, the costs were all based with um, the deans. You know, this, this came from above. They're, we're called a service center. So we don't have any control over the cost. We have benchmarked our cost with other GCRCs, peer GCRCs, and we're we're sort of right. So we're not too high, we're not too low, but that is a prohibitive thing for some. And so, what we encourage you to do is early on in your protocol development, come to us, and we'll work very closely with you to put your cost, our cost, in your grants. And you know, NIH reviewers, and I'm going to say that. They know that this is not a free service. And so they know you just have to bake in the cost. And people are doing that now and it's been pretty seamless. Um, we do offer a $5,000 voucher per year, per protocol, per investigator that are almost always funded to help defray the costs of our protocol initiation, which is about 1700 bucks, and then these other costs. So we can, when you submit your protocol, you can submit a simple letter of request and say, you know, I don't have the funding for these costs. Could you support the $5,000 voucher? And then we give those out to almost everybody. But we particularly want to favor junior investigators or people doing pilot studies. And so that's one thing. It's a thing. It's better than nothing. It comes from my age grant. Um, the other, what was the other question? So, what was the other one, Sandy? So the HMP for physical for uh, admissions. So ah, HMPs. Yes, that's still a thing, but it's and Rebecca can speak to it. But we we have streamlined that quite a bit. We've changed our SOPs two three years ago now, Sandy, where there are many different types of studies which we do not we no longer require an HMP. Um, if someone's a high risk patient, yes, pregnant, you know, whatever. Um, if they have an active disease, like if they have like CHF or something that might have an active component to it or may have the potential to develop that, we may require it on a case by case basis. Um, but a lot of the times now we're able to waive it. Um, but the other thing is if you have an, if a clinician has done an H and P in the th 30 days prior to the visit, then you can use that H and P. You don't need to have it done on our unit. So it's still a thing, uh, but it's less onerous than it used to be. 
but it's a requirement. It's kind of a JCO thing, and we're not alone among GCRCs and stuff on that. It's really a safety issue. And, um, you know, from time to time, we've had people who couldn't do the exercise training because they were having angina. You know, it's things like that. Uh, or, they, or they have hypotension or something like that. So we have to do that, even though it's not used very much. But again, that would be a place where if we could get an NP cadre from School of Nursing to be part of that, that would be a big help. Rebecca? Yeah, so one of the things that we've done, because we understand that that has been a barrier to non-physician researchers, is unless it's an intervention trial, you do not need an HMP within 30 days. So if it's just a blood draw, um, then you do not need an HMP. And we can work with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis to where if it is a study that does require an HMP, then we can help identify resources. However, if a patient, particular participants getting a study drug, we require an HMP. I mean, we have some rules and they're just, uh, you know, it is what it is, but we can help. If you don't have a physician collaborator or someone like that, we can match make you, uh, we can help with that. And, um, you know, off, it depends on the situation. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's an issue, but it's all, a, it's all about safety. And um, right. we're, we're a lot you. less onerous than we used to be, Sandy. Thank you for your flexibility. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, any other, do we have any other slides, Rebecca? Any other, no, oh yeah, this is good. You guys, if you guys can, if you guys have a few minutes, yes. we're pretty proud of this video, four minutes. There's also a question in the chat. I'm wondering if we can answer before moving to the video. Yeah. Go ahead, Park. Omics? Yes. Yeah, there's a several. Hang on. I'm sorry. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. Let me go back. Okay. So we're going to send you the, we're going to send you the fee schedule and Rebecca is the go-to person for that research residency for our PhD students. That would be great. It wouldn't be worth it like two days. I mean, if you want to do three or four months, mm -hmm. then the person could get a paper out of it or get a lot of good experience and stuff like that. And we can match make them with the mentors. Uh, can you offer the APN direct? The I'm question is that. about processing services and do you offer anything related? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. We, so yes, we, yes, to some extent. Okay, so. For example, many of you are familiar with uh, Dean Jones's group, but we now have um, Eric Ortland has now incorporated metabolomics into his lipidomics core. It's more of a targeted metabolomics thing. And, you know, th they would just require, you have to talk to them, but I think he just uses EDTA plasma um, or serum. I think they can do both. I don't know exactly, but you'd have to contact the or lipidomics faculty core. And so we don't process per se because there's no processing required except for what our lab does for al spinning, aliquoting, and temporary storage. So there's, there's that. Um, um, the uh, microbiomics, yes. Um, Colleen Kraft, myself, others are, well, Colleen Kraft is, yeah, so, so it depends on how you're doing your microbiome, your microbiome. Our nurses and our lab staff are prepared to process stool and um, we can do that. We're getting more and more microbiome protocols for in temporary storage. We don't do the analysis, of course. Um, we don't do any analysis in the GCRC. We don't do tests, um, but we can help you with that or put you in touch with the right people. Um, for example, we use a company that's very nice, but there's some um, biome analysis that Colleen Kraft does, etc. Um, the genomics, we don't provide the like the PAX gene tubes because they're very expensive. So we would ask the investigator to provide those, but then we would draw the blood and, you know, spin it down or whatever is necessary. I guess you don't spin those down. Um, metabol what's the other omics I'm missing? Epigenomics, I don't know. We don't do that. But what San... What, Sandy, what um, Colleen does, Colleen Kraft also 
you know, she does the FMT in the cystic, in the cystic, in the C. difficile patients. And she also does, correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, but her, she has a CLIA lab up in Woodruff that is an actual CLIA lab that's an outpost of the Department of Pathology. And she does, her lab can do RNA and DNA extraction, if I'm not incorrect. You're correct. And we can put you, yeah, what's that? And now that um, Colleen Kraft is our overall director, we work very closely with her lab. So if there are things that you need, because like Dr. Ziegler said, our GCRC lab is CLIA wave, but Colleen's lab is not, not CLIA wave. So there could be opportunities for support through her lab. Okay, thank you guys. That was my question actually. And <laughs> what I was also wondering is, so do you also offer, so you say you don't do any of the analysis, like none of, you don't do any of the sequencing or do you offer any bioinformatics support? So from a- We don't. Well, okay. The Georgia, Go ahead. the Georgia CTSA has a bioinformatics arm, so we can connect right. you to an individual within the CTSA, and they can explore options. So, um, again, that can be found by going to the Georgia CTSA website, but I'll send all that information out. Yeah, the Georgia CTSA website is good to look at if you haven't looked at it. And we can help direct you to the right people, like the bioinformatics, the biostatistics. We... We have biostatisticians that are on our GCRC payroll, so they can help with simple things like power analysis and stuff, but not from not not omics. Um, but we can put you in touch with the right. We can be good matchmakers for all that stuff. And then another question: Are costs static or do they change? I mean, we're subject to service center costs directed by the deans. And so I presume they're going to go up over time, but you know, I don't, what are they three years at a time they reevaluate Rebecca? So um, because we are a federal service center, we do have a fee schedule and we work in the School of Medicine to publish those rates. And we have to review it every two years. Um, this year, our fees are not going to go up. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we brought a business manager who's housed in the GCRC to help us work through that because we want to make our costs as affordable as they can be. Um, so this year, um, they are not going to go up. But we'll let you know if they do. Yeah, absolutely. We'll send you an email <laughs> and they'll be on the, they'll be on the thing. So, yeah, I mean, you can expect some change over time. Um, but yeah, so I, what would a PI need to do to account for these cost escalations? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess you just have to, I don't know, because I we don't know what the yearly change is going to be. I mean, it's not going to be massive. I'd say it's going to be like 5% or something like that per year. But but the key thing is to talk to us. Don't send your grant in using our services and then forget to put our costs in. That's That was a problem during our transition. And we, lost, we did lose some investigators, um, which was anticipated because they said, hey, I got funded. But then you guys didn't tell me you were going to charge for your services. We're, 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 we're way past that now. Now everybody comes to us. We work with them on their budget. And we are growing. And we're not losing investigators because of that anymore, per se. Although it's expensive. There's no doubt about it. There's, it's, there's costs associated. But the thing that we have, though, is we have boilerplate for your grants. We, have, we can write you letters of support. I think using our services helps the grants. We have all the boilerplate on, you know, like all the new nursing units and the resources and the equipment. And, you know, we write letters of support all the time. And so I suggest you talk to us real early. Do you guys want to watch a movie now or do you have any other questions? It's a four minute movie. So this video, um, the Georgia CTSA- I don't look too good at the movie. But anyway. The Georgia CTSA here at Emory is celebrating their 60th anniversary. Um, and we would have been in the throes of um, celebration. We, were, we had open house plans. We were going to do a big talk, but because of COVID, we're unable to do those types of things. So we had a videographer come and do a video that just highlights the GCRC. So it's only about three minutes. So I'm going to play this right now. Hopefully it's going to work. Yeah, it's all we have time. We've been talking the whole time. It's not wanting to show.
There it goes. Yeah. My name is Randy Smith. I'm a trauma surgeon here at Grady Hospital. As a part of my research experience, I reached out to the CTSA. We have a lot of resources, including the GCRC here at Grady Hospital. Uh, Georgia Clinical and Translational Science Alliance. It really offers research infrastructure, but the clinical research centers, GCRTs, are within the Georgia CTSA. I became the director of the Georgia. Yes. Children has grown significantly. We have now uh, GCRC, uh, Emory University, Clifton, Midtown, Grady. I think part of the reason we're able to accelerate innovation with research is through our collaborations. Our CTSA brings together the four major academic institutions within the state of Georgia. We get to have perspectives inserted into our work that leads to better ideas, that leads to better science. I get very excited when I'm with this really high quality group and when their ideas are elevated, it's really amazing what happens. We offer a range of services, biostatistics, to informatics, to bionutrition, body composition. They're state of the art. They have DEXA scanners, state of the art, indirect calorimetry, and these are all tools that I commonly use. We also offer study coordinator services and research design. We have a tremendous amount of resources that are available to new investigators, training programs, studio consults. They would handhold me when I needed to be handheld. We have a medical technologist who can help them design their processing protocol. One of the, the major programs that they have for junior investigators is a stipend to go towards the costs of any of your research studies. They have a program where they link you up with a mentor that has experience with grant writing. I am where I am today because people invested in me. Perhaps one of the most gratifying things, the opportunity to mentor these very smart uh, young uh, investigators. I think the most exceptional thing about our GCRC is the dedication and skill of our staff. The nursing staff is amazing. There's a lot of longevity in this area. This is my 34th year as a nurse. I was the first nurse to care for an Ebola patient in the United States. I myself come with 32 years of experience. There are people that have 20 something years or better. I feel like this is my home, second home for me. I'm so passionate about working in this unit. They report everything appropriately, they get all the right data, and they double check me. They make sure that I am doing everything by my protocol to make sure that the data that we put out there is trustable by our community. I am just in awe of these nurses who quickly go in, establish their rapport, everything is done according to the steps that are set out. And that's really more of an art than people realize. And remember, at the other end of this is a patient, is a therapeutic, is a vaccine. We're able to give patients access to treatments that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have access to. That's why we're here, is to be able to facilitate that bench to bedside. I've been very proud of the clinical research work for COVID. We're helping individuals be successful, but we're also bringing really great things to patients and patient care. It makes it a really fun place to do research. I think that's why our subjects come back year after year. We try to create an environment where everyone feels feel safe to offer what they can offer, creating better science. The CTSA and the GCRC are very trustworthy because they have a long track record. You know, we've been here for 60 years. We are celebrating our 60 years anniversary, and I think that we're going to continue doing this for many, many more years to come. My advice is that you should reach out as soon as you can. The very beginning of a research project is the best time to reach out. Go on to the website. You get an immediate response back. We think about ourselves as being a one-stop shop. Come talk to us about your idea. It doesn't matter how well-formed it is. No matter how big or how small, we'll find a way. We can help you with that research. We can help you be successful. To the prospective researcher, I'd say, let's get started. It's a great video. I y'all should be very proud of that. I'm sure you are. Did you guys hear it? It was really bad sound for me. It broke up here and there, but it, I could mostly hear it. I thought it was an excellent video. Excellent. And congratulations on 60 years. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, so anyway, we want you to come on down and uh, talk to Rebecca, me, uh, 
anybody else you know that you want to work with and we'll, we'll bat, we're good matchmakers and uh, really Sandy, Sandy brought up some of the issues in the past that were frustrating, but we're really trying to mitigate a lot of that now. And um, it's like, if you haven't been around, you know, why don't we can't like wander around the unit very more, but anymore, but the amount of people that we've been able to hire is incredible because of how busy we are. And, um, you know, the place is really booming. I mean, it's we need more nurses at some point, but right now we're sort of at capacity for nurses. Um, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, it happens to me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not talk, I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> so um, I'll, send out, I'll send out this slideshow as well as the link to the video and okay. then the CTSA website address and then our fee schedule. Okay, perfect. Rebecca, if you send that to me, I'll make sure that everyone uh, here and those who weren't able to attend get it as well. Okay. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you spending an hour with us today. Thank you for your hour and your time and your expertise as well. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.